care and government moderated by the brilliant Mustafa al Rawi. We launch the trust report every year at the World Economic Forum. Um, and we've been measuring trust in institutions for the past 32 years. Today is the UAE's local report. It's an extensive report of 32,000 respondents across 28 countries, with an average of about 1,200 respondents. I'm going to call out a couple of countries um, which have bucked the trend globally, including Saudi Arabia and Kenya throughout the report. There are certain themes which play out um, every year. And since 2018, we've seen a battle for truth. And last year, we saw a cycle of distrust. This year, we're seeing a polarized world. So people are facing uh, economic shocks, such as inflation, interest rate spikes, conflict, as well as climate change without a trust safety net. And we'll get more into that and di uh, digest the drivers and themes behind that. Why, why measure trust? Well, trust matters because organizations and countries are more likely to have external partners. They're more likely to be more resilient in terms of crisis. They're more likely to attract external advocates and supporters and investors. And importantly, they're more likely to have workplace recommendations to attracting some of the best talent. The Edelman's point of view is that action earns trust. Trust earns action, i.e. giving you the license to lead. And that action can lead to growth. On here is the country uh, chart for, um, for the UAE. And what we see is that despite economic headwinds, the UAE is still one of the most trusted countries globally at 74%. There are a couple of other call outs here. Kenya, you can see is one of the biggest gainers where they've moved from neutral into trust. And then if you look at the other gainers, countries such as the US, even though they've seen a, a double a, an increase, they're still in the least trusted. And then also interestingly is that Europe fares quite badly in terms of Germany, Spain, UK being distrusted. And now we're moving on to the theme I mentioned in terms of navigating a polarized world. What drives polarization is a lack of trust in government and media, economic pessimism as opposed to optimism, and then a lack of shared identity. So if we look at those economic anxieties, 24 out of the 28 countries that we looked at, the people think that they will be worse off in five years time than they are now. Business is the only trusted institution. So we look at trust across government, business, NGOs, and media. Globally, business is the only trusted institution, while in the UAE, all four institutions are trusted. And there is a trust gap between the people in certain incomes and education compared to the masses. The trust with those is widening. And then, as I mentioned, there's been a continued uh, challenge for gathering uh, trusted sources of information. Polarization happens when, when those deep divisions become entrenched. So if we look at this chart, the top right-hand country, respondents see deep divisions and they don't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. The bottom left are respondents saying they, see deep, uh, they don't see deep divisions. If we were to plot the countries on there, you can see that Argentina is a highly polarized country. The risk is that the, the countries in this severe risk of polarization include Western Europe, such as France and the UK. The UAE is one of the most unified countries. Again, that's because there is trust in the institutions and there is a shared identity and there is shared optimism. This is a bit technical, but I wanted to show it to you. The drivers for trust in business, government and NGOs is because they're seen as, as ethical and competent. Media isn't distrusted, but it's just plotted slightly differently because of the uh, inclusion of social media in that categorization. So it pulls it more into the middle. And then when prompted, people are concerned about global issues. People are worried about economic fears and societal fears, things like job losses, climate change, energy shortages. The good thing is that the UAE has taken action across most of these concerns. If we were to take job losses, things like automation, competition, digitization, et cetera, the economic reforms that the UAE government has implemented over the past couple of years to reassure and attract the best talent to the country. Climate change, we all know that COP28 is being hosted uh, later this year in the country. And then on energy shortages, the, the country has been on a long-term diversification agenda for the past 15 years. Even on food shortages, there's a minister of food security. And my colleagues globally present a very different report to this, where the UAE here ranks high amongst economic optimism, 
So you can see that the UAE is above 70% in terms of economic optimism. Compare that to the rest of the world where we've seen a 10 point drop over the past year. So it's went from 50% to 40%. If you look at the countries that are least trusted and that they think they'll be worse off in five years time, you can again see Western Europe, Italy, Germany, France, the UK, Netherlands. And then I mentioned Kenya at the beginning in terms of how they've gained trust and how they've actually become um, economically optimistic. This interesting story there is that even though they're on 80%, it's actually been an 11 point decrease for them over the course of the last year. So they're still the most economically optimistic, but that has come down because of the economic shocks. And then in the UAE, all the institutions are trusted. I mentioned that business is the only trusted institution globally. In the UAE, all four. So if we take the UAE on the left-hand side, government is the most trusted institution, 86%. And there is clear daylight between that and, and global average of 50%. I mentioned Argentina being severely polarized. If you look at the trust in Argentinian government, it's at 20%, followed by South Africa. Again, they were plotted towards the top right hand of the screen. Again, if business is the only trusted institution globally, if you look in the UAE, it's at 78%, globally it's at 62%. So again, there's clear daylight between those. And media globally is just on the threshold of neutral and distrust at 50%. And then in the UAE, all institutional leaders are trusted. So if you can see that scientists are still um, have the credit in the bank from the pandemic. But the interesting point here is the echo chamber of people like me. So my neighbors, my CEO, my co-workers, citizens of my country, people are, are believing and reverberating content and uh, believing in trust based on people in their own circles. And then institutions are seen as reliable at sources of information. Government is seen as the most reliable source in the UAE, followed by business and followed by media. Again, globally, media is distrusted in terms of being a trusted source of information. And the drag on that, again, is, is social media. The power of brands. So brands bring us together to emphasize a common, a common theme and, and strengthen the social fabric. You can see the UAE is on 75%. The global average is on 68%. Again, Western Europe fares badly if you move to the right hand of the screen. And what I mean by this is actually having common shared goals. So to tackle climate change, COP28 is being hosted here. The mission to Mars. Expo brought the, brought the world together and was able, the UAE was able to tell the story about its long-term journey over the past 50 years or so. And there are clear expectations for business and CEOs. If we look at this, CEOs are expected to talk about difficult subjects and take action. Remember what I said in terms of action earns trust. So CEOs are expected to discuss treatment of employees, things like climate change, as well as discrimination, so employee protection. And people do want more action from business. We can see it's three and a half time multiple in terms of people expecting business to step up. They're not doing enough on climate change. And then it's a two and a half time multiple across things like workforce training, access to healthcare, and energy shortages. What this all means is, as I said, action leads to trust. For the UAE, that means it should maintain its economic optimism, it should continue to provide trusted sources of information across the whole ecosystem. Business and other entities must continue to collaborate with government and contribute to the shared values and the economic, economic optimism, which is the priority. At this point, I'm gonna hand over to Musfra Rawi to moderate a panel, as I said, with respected um, representatives from government, healthcare, technology, and energy. Mustafa. Thanks, Omar. I appreciate you going through the results of the UAE Trust Barometer as you did. You, you picked out a couple of things that um, maybe we were surprised about. For example, Kenya's results. Can you give us a bit more color on that? Sure. So the results by Kenya is driven by high trust in business and NGOs. Um, government isn't trusted, um, but what they've done is move from neutral into trust. And then there are some anomalies in there, as I mentioned, in terms of the economic optimism. So people actually believe they'll be better off in five years time. Um, they're actually um, seen an 11 point drop over the, over the course of the last year, which is one of the biggest drops globally. And you mentioned Saudi Arabia as well, where trust is very high. 
is 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 that a function you think of of the last few years there in terms of social change so look i grew up in saudi arabia and the country is changing and it is modernizing um i think there is high trust in, in government and in the country because of the social and economic reforms which are giving more younger people employment opportunities education opportunities as well as entertainment um so that's that's what's driving trust in that country if I if I connect the dots from what you were saying, um, and we'll get to the panel in a sec, I just want to wrap up this thought as a nice segue uh, to that discussion. You you were talking about resilience as being you know one of the factors behind why trust is important for a brand or a company or an institution, but and and also it kind of goes hand in hand with growth. I mean, can we can, can I sum it up as crudely as saying that high levels of trust mean you're more likely to make more money? Um. I would say that's one of the factors, but it's also about brand awareness and brand resilience. So if we take Dubai-based family business, Majid al Fatem, during the pandemic, when they redeployed staff from the cinemas to where it's most needed most in terms of the e-commerce business, they actually took action there to protect jobs as well as serve the community because we were all in lockdown at the time. Because of that, they actually have high trust um, and brand awareness. So yes, it might benefit at the bottom line, but it, in terms of other metrics, it can be seen as, as um, beneficial. So we're gonna have a, a discussion for about 30 minutes uh, among our panelists, but and afterwards we're gonna take audience questions. So uh, bear with us uh, until we get to yours, but hopefully we'll keep you entertained and engaged given who we have on our esteemed panel, um, including Tarek Ben-Hendi, who's the chairman of uh, Edelman Middle East, uh, Brian De Francesco, who's the CEO of Thumbay Healthcare, Paul Slinger, head of communications at Mubadala Energy, and from Astrotech, Murtaza Virani. So I'm very pleased that you're all with us this morning in, in, in probably what is one of the more important conversations happening uh, in the Gulf this morning, because trust is key, given the last few months in particular, We've seen uh, much upheaval, which, which Omar indicated in his presentation. But also, if we think about what's been happening with artificial intelligence in the last few months, chat GPT, et cetera, um, getting into the public domain, it represents both risk and opportunity. And trust will actually determine whether these things become risks or opportunities. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll discuss a variety of, of topics around trust um, in the next 30 minutes. I mean, perhaps... Um, uh, Tarek, I can start with you, if that's okay. Um, when it comes to the UAE specifically, it bucks the trend. There's a lot of trust in government as well as the other institutions. Do, do you have a perspective on this? I do. And, and so good morning to everyone that's attending this call, to my fellow panelists. Uh, Omar, thank you for that presentation. You know, in my time in government, I suppose um, it, it's worth noting, um, it was quite interesting to look at how it was that we went about building trust, right? And it was both uh, organic, but also very purposeful. And so, you know, when you look at job creation in the region, when you look at the young population, the demographic, I would say almost imbalance in terms of the youth that we have here relative to older generations, vis-a-vis -vis what the US, European and, and, and Japanese uh, structure looks like today. The mission has always been about creating hope, right? And I, I, I'm trying not to sound cliche here, right? But how do you instill hope in a very broad population here in the region that continues to grow through um, you know, immigrant uh, employment as well as young people coming into the marketplace? And how do you continue to create that opportunity? And, I so, and so I think what has happened, especially during COVID where you know, our leadership, Hassan Sheikh Hamad got on TV and basically told everyone in Arabic, la shillun hem, right? Which means carry no concern, do not be concerned. I think that instilled a lot of um, confidence, but also hope in, in the leadership here in the region and, and in the UAE in particular. And so that resonated with people. I compare that to the way COVID was handled in other markets, right? And I think COVID more than anything was a testament to the institutions that have been built here in the region and what has been put in place. And so that benefited us massively in terms of really being able to show that what we have built has been built for the people. And I think that that just continues to, to be amplified through what has been happening in the UAE, through the growth that's been occurring, through the number of people moving to the region from other markets. And, um, and I think the government is very well placed to, to continue that momentum and that traction. And that hope is creating that trust 
between government institutions and the broad population here. Thank you, Tariq, for that. And, and you mentioned health there, and I, I think that's very important, especially um, officially now. Um, the World well, the, uh, the World Health Organization, rather, has said that COVID is actually over, which is a relief, obviously, for all of us. Um, but I, 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 that's why I'll turn to Brian because the example of COVID is instructive for all of us in terms of trust. We had to suddenly overnight trust so many different sources of information, but also be wary about what was being conveyed that might not be accurate. Um, so what, what's your viewpoint in terms of, of, of where we are in trust, both in the UAE and elsewhere? Uh, thank you. Uh, I came to the UAE about 15 years ago with Johns Hopkins. Uh, I've been fortunate to have worked in North America, Europe, Asia, and for 15 years here in the region. Uh, uh, in healthcare, our patients, our patients trust us with their lives. Right, so we in turn need to be able to trust the institutions that we work with. You know, I can say from my experience working pretty much everywhere in the world, uh, I trust the the government and the leadership here uh, definitely more than I've trusted any other leadership and government government anywhere else in the world. Uh, and that's allowed us to make uh, some very uh, important decisions over the past during COVID. I was working both in Kuwait. And then I came back here working with uh, Al Jalila Foundation, and now I'm uh, uh, the head of uh, Thun Bay Health. Uh, and uh, I feel that when we're when when the government is setting policy, you know, it 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 may need to adapt, but it's not going to waffle back and forth as much as I've seen uh, in the, in North America or in Europe. Uh, so it, it just it, it allows us to uh, strategically partner with the government where if, if they're going down a certain path, uh, we can then align our resources uh, uh, to best support that. And COVID was a great example. We were all able to collaborate. Uh, when, I was, when I was in Kuwait, uh, we quickly, almost overnight, set up a, 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 test, a test lab within our facility. Uh, now here at Thumbay, uh, we dedicated a complete hospital, uh, our Dubai facility, uh, into a, a COVID hospital supporting the government. So it's very much a, a real partnership, as opposed to what I've, you know, I've seen in other countries where you know, my my counterparts uh, in North America they're battling with and working around the government. Where here it's it's a continual uh, partnership in the, in the truest sense of the word, and not only locally, but we collaborate with the government on our international activities as well. And do you, do you see the that situation coming out of COVID? How did that help you in terms of your business, knowing that you'd established those levels of trust and cooperation? Did, did it allow you to find other opportunities? Uh, very much so. I mean, uh, you know, while COVID was obviously very unfortunate and, and, and harmful for many people, uh, we all learned a lot, uh, you know, going through that. Uh, as, uh, as part of Thumbay Academic Health System, we have the Gulf Medical University. And, you know, and as a teaching institution, all of a sudden the students can't come to, uh, can't come to school. Uh, so as a, a byproduct of that, we, we had to develop a, a, an online uh, education platform called Health Varsity. And it was originally designed to, for only for our students within uh, the Gulf Medical University. However, now after COVID, we're realizing that the, the, the uses and applications of that spread not only across our current students in the university, but then also globally. So, so it's given us opportunities to, to expand internationally our reach based on what we've learned from COVID. Uh, it's also uh, uh, led us to start developing a more of a hybrid workforce model that we may have not developed before. Uh, so th th there have been several very positive uh, outcomes from it. Um, you mentioned cooperation between business and, and, and government. And I know Mataza, you, you're Astrotech's chief legal officer. So this is an area that, that you're, you're particularly keen on, on, on discussing. Um, from your point of view in, in, in the tech space, how does, where does trust and sort of the collaboration between government and, uh, and business come together to create the kind of environment that you're looking for as a business? Thanks, Mustafa, and obviously the organizers for having me. Um, I passed the first tech test by unmuting myself successfully. 
So I'm pretty happy and can feed that back. Uh, look, collaboration between business and government, I believe, is a cornerstone uh, of success in the UAE. Um, the government's, government's proactive approach uh, in implementing policies and initiatives, uh, it not only supports businesses, but also encourages investment and growth as well, both locally and on an international scale. Um, I think one prime example that I'd like to cite here, and it's difficult not to cite this one, is obviously the success of Dubai, uh, Dubai Expo. Um, here we saw businesses, governments, organizations worldwide unite to exchange ideas and showcase innovation. And it was a, it was a great success. Um, you know, I should focus on legal and regulatory matters. Um, so from, th from that perspective, I think the establishment of financial free zones uh, demonstrates the government's ability to recognize that industry needs to adapt quickly and to provide familiar legal and regulatory framework. Uh, and this really spurs multinational trade and positions UAE as the vital hub for business that it wants to be. Closer to Astra uh, and our aspirations, the UAE government has and continues to acknowledge uh, in our space, the importance of digital assets and FinTech industry. Um, by uh, legislating for uh, and creating prudential frameworks, uh, we believe that these industries are already thriving and will thrive again in the future. Um, our collaborative uh, relationship with the government, we believe at Astra is palpable. Um, we have a constant communication with regulators discussing ideas. We help to lobby on certain regulations uh, and our new product offerings test the boundaries. But at the same time, we seek to align with regulatory uh, and compliance landscapes. We believe that our, our regulators prioritize consumer protection, which is obviously very, very important. Uh, and it's one of the main tug of war challenges that I have trying to ensure consumer protection, but at the same time, pushing the boundaries to allow for uh, innovative products to come out into the market. Um, but again, at the end of the day, we do and, and we try our best to, to steer clear of political problems and things like this throughout all of our products, which again, when pushing the boundaries could test that. Lastly, through our Ultra app, which was recently launched, the Botum 3.0, um, we support directly governments by offering essential services, such as, for example, utility bill payments, Emirates ID uh, renewals, visa services, uh, and we also uh, you know, facilitate international money transfers. Um, we believe that this fosters the UAE's business-friendly environment, encourages fintech innovation, building trust with the government, and demonstrates our commitment to the community. I think the integration of these services into our app enhances efficiency, effectiveness, and also accessibility for consumers and citizens alike. Uh, you mentioned digital assets, of course, trust has been such an important part of their growth, both in terms of, of how much and how little um, there might be at any particular time, it tends to ebb and, and, and flow. And then you mentioned about financial centers. We had the news yesterday that Abu Dhabi Global Markets expanding uh, the financial center there um, exponentially, which is, again, it talks about the priorities here and how it matches um, what's happening in terms of trends and, and the world. And, and if we think about the UAE, the Gulf, and then the wider world and the differing levels of trust, whatever the sector is, um, whatever the area, how do, how do you communicate in that environment? And I think it, it's good to bring Paul Slinger in from Mubadala Energy because that's literally your day job, given Mubadala Energy has, has obviously uh, you know, a glo global audience, but also very much from the UAE and Abu Dhabi. So how do you, how do you manage the different <laughs> levels of trust, Paul, when you're trying to communicate effectively? And that, thank you, Mustafa, and uh, thanks for inviting me to speak on this uh, panel. Omar on the team at Edelman, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a really good question, and just to, to paint the picture a little bit, we are a business that is really purely international. We have Dolphin Energy in our portfolio, which is historically very important to the UE's development because of uh, the supply of gas that has driven um, economic or supported economic diversification and growth. But basically, we are in 11 markets around the world. So when we go into Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Egypt, Israel recently last year, we are relying to some degree on the, the repository of trust that the UE government and Abu Dhabi has built over 
you know, however many decades, well, since 1971 and before, frankly. Um, because as a business, we have to be the ambassador um, for the UE in Abu Dhabi to some extent when we are going in our partners, our host governments. Um, so trust is, is absolutely integral to how we do business. And without it, we can't. Obviously, being a government-owned owned, owned company, that is massively beneficial. Um, but as an energy business, there are some core things that we need to do. And you know, most energy leaders would say the same, but HSSE, so safety, um, and what we do with regards to the environment, but safety, absolutely essential. If you're going to partner with um, a government on a major capital intensive project, there are huge risks. They need to trust you. They need to know that you're going to take it really seriously, which of course we do. The second thing is community. What are you going to do to invest in the community? How are you going to support and spread the economic benefit of an investment you're making to the local community? So, for instance, we partner with local fishing communities to build their awareness of entrepreneurial skills, understanding of marine ecology and uh, restoration. Um, we partner with local um, authorities as well to support that. Um, and then the, the third one, I think, is... Um, you know, we talked, uh, Tarek, you know, had a really good way of describing it, kind of building hope, you know, and actually, you know, that vision piece is so important. So when we are speaking to our, our partners, which often are local governments, obviously, we have um, energy partners as well, when we are either a joint venture or part of a consortium in an asset, but ultimately, the government partner, they have their own priorities. And in, in the energy space, that is typically energy security, as we all know, and energy transition. So when we want to be a trusted partner, we need to tap in to our partner's priority. So I think I would bring it back to that. You know, actually trust for me, there's a simple equation. You say what you're going to do, you do it, and then hopefully people trust you. If you don't deliver on that, then you need to explain how you haven't quite achieved that. But the, the bit on the top is understanding the context and what the partner's priorities are. And if you get that right, you can play into what is trusted for them or how you can build trust with them because you are supporting their priorities. And I think, you know, to your point at the top, Mustafa, and, and what Omar was saying about polarization, one of the big challenges, of course, is that people don't really spend the time in understanding the universe around them, the stakeholders, people who might have different perspectives and how you can build into what they need in their lives, whether it's economic goals, whether it's social goals, whether it's personal goals. So, um, that's that's kind of how I how I look at it, and it's, as I said, Mustafa, trust totally central to how you work as an energy business. And if you're an international company representing part of the UAE in Abu Dhabi, it's just absolutely integral to success. Uh, Mustafa, can I add on what Paul was saying? Because I think it's actually Paul, you hit the nail on the head, right? There's two points here. One, I think when you look at stability, right, and you look at plans, the UAE doesn't announce three-year plans or four-year plans. We announce five, 10, 15, 50-year plans, right? So everyone has this goal that they're working towards, right? And the, the, the goal is to try to achieve that plan beforehand. So we don't have the political disruption that you have to deal with in many other places, right? In terms of constant changes and election cycle, really every two to three years based on when people run, so on and so forth. So again, that stability, that focus is very helpful to trying to accomplish long-term goals. But equally, and I think this is something that's very important and feeds directly into the, the trust component that I think Paul was describing, is I remember about 10 years ago or so when Sheikh Hamad bin Rashid stood up and talked about how we were going to become the most tolerant country in the world. And the Western media attacked us for using the word tolerant as though we were, you know, savage by nature and had to, you know, make ourselves tolerant in terms of our approach to things. You fast forward 10 years today and look at the intolerance that you have in many countries that we have, you know, that many parts of the world have modeled themselves after, right? Uh, particularly in the West. And you look at the level of intolerance they have towards, forget, you know, non-nationals uh, or natives, but the people amongst themselves, right? Their fellow neighbors and citizens. And you look at what kind of peace that we have here in the UAE, and, and this feeds directly into trust. Families do not have to do not want to have to worry about their children's well-being every two to four years and what kind of environment they'll have to put them in. They want that stability. They want that growth. They want that maturity. You have that in the UAE. You see that developing in the kingdom today. 
you have those changes that are they're manifesting in the wider region today in terms of that stability that people are looking for. And frankly, I think that you know everything that Paul, Murtaza, Brian have alluded to, whether it's healthcare, whether it's energy, whether it's technology, has really fed into this sense of being that when you're here, you're part of the journey, right? You're not just one person out of 10.5 million people, right? You've actually got a role to play. And I think that's really important for the trust component. Mustafa, if you allow me just a, a quick second on that as well. Look, coming from the UK and having been, I was born in East Africa, I lived in the UK, I studied in the US, went back and qualified as a lawyer in the UK and then moved to Dubai, right? And I moved initially because of family pressure, because people were moving, right, at the time, because of opportunity. Um, but I think one thing that always stands out, actually two things that always stand out to me are the following. One is whenever I go away on holiday anywhere in the world, one living in Dubai, it's the one place that I want to be back home uh, sooner than anywhere else. Like if I go from the UK to the Maldives, I'm not going to want to be back in the UK, right? I'm going to, you know, I'm craving for vitamin D. But when I'm in Dubai and I go anywhere, even when I go back to the UK, I land at Heathrow. And the minute I see that there's no trolleys present, there, it's a complete shambles, frankly. I want to be back in the UAE, right? I want to land back at, uh, at the airport at Terminal 3. And this is important is to note that the expat demographic that we have here is not a fluid expat demographic. People, when they come here, they establish presence. It's not like, for example, say some people in Saudi, you may see other places where they'll travel there for the week and then come back on the weekend to their family. No, people here, they establish a presence and they establish their families on the ground here and they work, live and unify here uh, together as, as a collective demographic. And I think all of this lends itself to this very interesting topic that's been raised, which is trust, both in, in the economy, in the business and socially and beyond. Yeah, I'd like to just follow on that just personally. Uh, we've mentioned that the, the importance of what we do over just what we say. I think if we look at those of us that are expats, the fact that we're choosing to live here. I came here 15 years ago. I've had the opportunity to return to the US. I've had the opportunity to work and live in Europe. I've had the opportunity to return to uh, Asia. I'm still here. I'm looking to buy a house here now and planning on retiring here. The proof is in the pudding. If I did not trust and believe in the long-term future, of the UAE, I wouldn't have been here this long, and I wouldn't plan on literally uh, spending the rest of my life here with my wife, Nadine. So, you know, it's actions definitely speak louder than words. Hi, sorry to jump in. I know we're uh, we're stealing the thunder here, Mustafa, but just to um, build on that thought, I mean, one thing we haven't touched on, I'm sure we were going to come on to, is the role of young people in this. It kind of is inherent in what Tarek was saying and what we've all been saying about this idea of vision and hope, right? Um, but I think there's an interesting correlation between how young people see the world and how they trust institutions, government, media, society, right? And I personally think it's incumbent on everyone, especially as, you know, we've been in our careers for a certain amount of time, you know, and, and we've benefited from lots of things that the next generation won't benefit from. So we need to paint an optimistic view of the world. Um, and when you read and watch and listen to things around generative AI and the kind of dystopian future, you know, it's probably quite easy as a young person to feel a bit pessimistic about the world ahead of us, right? But I would just leave the, the thought that there's young people that I deal with in, in, in the energy space, which you might imagine a lot of young people would feel quite negative towards. Well, actually, my experience has been the opposite. There's uh, an organization called Student Energy, which brings together young people from around the world um, and is hosting the Student Energy Summit around COP28. And we're supporting that along with Arena, Mazda and others. Um, this is about 600 kids, 20 year olds, who are passionate about energy and its role in developing society, passionate about energy transition and want to make a difference and want to engage industry. Um, so I just leave that thought, you know, there's a partnership model there, right? Young people are coming together in this, this instance to partner with um, industry and government to try and find solutions. And the reason they're doing that is because they trust that we actually can do this together, right? And um, we, uh, I, I'll just say to, to everyone that's listening and, and, and us as a, a panel, you know, it's incumbent on us to paint a positive picture and create those opportunities for young people. Um, 
So Mustafa, apologies. We, we've uh, stolen your thunder, but perhaps we, we leave you, go back to you for another question. I mean, I was about to order a cup of tea and relax and let you guys keep talking. I think that, that this is the best kind of panel. Um, I, I love everything you've all said because, I mean, I think what, what the leadership in the UAE was able to do very intuitively, very early after the financial crisis, was to understand that uh, soft infrastructure had become more important than sort of the bottom line, if you like, and that um, nobody was taking for granted any more things like access to affordable health care access to affordable education, access to, to homes. Even now, if we look at what's happening in parts of the world, um, the developed economies, no one can take for granted even just basic security. Um, so all, the, all these things that actually, is, as Murtaza said very eloquently, using uh, Heathrow Airport as the analogy, I don't think we can hammer Heathrow Airport too much in this conversation, um, given the experience anyone would have there. Um, the, the balance of hard and soft infrastructure here in the UAE and, and in other Gulf economies but also this, this idea that um, we, we understand what is required to have uh, good well-being, and that's becoming as important as, as economic opportunity, and that builds trust. Um, when supply chains aren't working, um, when they're stressed because of Brexit or some other thing, um, where, you know, whether it's COVID-related or otherwise, that will undermine trust immediately on a daily basis. Um, so I think the, these are things that... The UAE has never taken for granted, has always worked upon. And I think that they're seeing the benefits of, of, of that now. But it, given that we, we have you know, senior executives here on this panel, I mean, I'd be interested to know personally, um, and, and feel free to jump in, um, uh, whoever wants to, to answer this first, as, a, as a, either a leader or a chief executive, how, how do you handle day-to-day -day the responsibility of carrying of trust in a way that perhaps previous generations, you didn't have to, to own it so much as, as you do now. Please, Brian. I'd be happy to, um, you know, with all, with our virtual world, and as, as Paul mentioned about the, uh, everything what's happening with AI, uh, it, it's becoming harder for people to trust, you know, the emails they get and even with the videos that we're seeing now. So uh, the WhatsApps, while well, initially all of the social media was supposed to bring people, make us more connected, I think we've all found that it's actually kind of separated us all. So in, in the past, it may have been possible for a chief executive to, to stay in the, uh, the palatial offices in the top floor of the building uh, you know, I've I've found that it's it's become mission critical uh, to get out on a daily basis and, and and really you know breathe the same air as the people. Uh, the office I'm sitting in right now, I'm actually in the process of converting it to a meeting room because I won't be sitting behind this desk hardly ever. You know, we you know across the five Northern Emirates, we have 1,300 people that I know I need to be out there engaging with them on a daily basis, as well as our uh, 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 large uh, community of patients. So just really just breaking that that digital divide and, and, and getting face to face with people. I found it to be very important. And then just restating the same theme about uh, we're not going to be judged by what we say, we're going to be judged by what we do. And so just making sure uh, that, you know, whatever I say I'm going to do, I actually I can and, and do do that. And I know the others, you know, feel the same way. I'm going to jump in here because that's a really important point. And in all of your answers to the first question, you spoke about strategy, vision, collaboration. There is, from the government perspective, a clear strategy being set and there is a long-term vision. There is collaboration across all institutions and you're all pulling together in the same direction to execute those strategies. I think as Tarek said, if there's a lack of trust in government in other markets, people aren't gonna believe them. If there's gonna be sort of party gate in number 10 in the UK, why would people follow COVID policies or why would they actually follow the rules? So I do think there is a clear thread here, having a clear strategy and vision, the collaboration across all entities leads to execution, which if you look at it, builds trust capital. And I'm, I'm gonna just very briefly mention this. Paul said something really important. As he goes into other markets, what he, need, what he suggested was that other people need to go outside their circles. 
what was interesting was that I said people are actually trusting people within their circles locally, right? My employee, my CEO, my neighbors, et cetera. People do need to go outside of their circles to have a more worldwide view as we operate in a more um, sort of borderless world. Yeah, Paul, so, were you going to say something? Yeah, yeah uh, just, just quickly to, to respond to uh, Mustafa's point, just, just three quick thoughts, really. Um, the first one Brian mentioned, which I think is a brilliant thought, actually, which I hadn't occurred to me. And when you say it, it's like, like any brilliant thought, it seems so obvious. Actually, one of the ways of engendering trust is you can't fake someone looking, looking at you in the eye, right? So let's do that more. And I, I couldn't agree with that that more. So just wanted to say that that's brilliant. I'm going to take that away. But three three quick thoughts was just, just on the point about AI. Um, there's a guy called, uh, I think it's Nicholas Thomas, the CEO of The Atlantic, um, who does a lot of really great stuff. And he's been um, really advocating the idea of labeling in, in, a, in AI. Uh, I, I personally think from the outset, that's something regulators need to think about. So that's one solution, you know, if something's going to be AI generated, perhaps the regulators can say it needs to be labelled that it is AI, because otherwise we're, we're we're already seeing that there's huge problems with trust. That's one. Two um, is just building on the point I was making earlier about um, young people, and uh, frankly, for all of us, we all have agency, and we shouldn't be too pessimistic. Um, there are huge opportunities to make a difference. Um, trust is part of that, and we need to trust that. We can make a difference. And the third piece, I would say, which is slightly selfishly, is from an energy perspective, we get a, a hard time sometimes because of, um, you know, misunderstanding is around energy transition and climate change, I would say. But, you know, actually, one of the best places to make a difference is in the energy sector. And we need young people to do that. And they need to trust us that we are part of the solution. We can be part of the solution. And you can make the biggest impact by joining the energy sector where there are brilliant engineers with brilliant ideas and the infrastructure and ideas to make a difference. So just three kind of thoughts um, on, on the, that point, Mustafa, about how you how you lead and how you present something that can address what can sometimes feel a bit overwhelming when it comes to trust and some of the issues we're facing. I mean, Paul, you, you, you face an uphill battle in the energy sector purely because you touch everything and everyone's lives, right, in some way or the other. And so it doesn't matter if, you know, it's a drill somewhere pulling out oil or if you have a cruise liner that's dumping oil, you know, up in the, the Atlantic as they go across, right? It's always going to come back and say, oh, it's energy's fault rather than it being a behavioral issue, right? And I think this is where that consistency and message and delivery, and you see what's been done in Abu Dhabi, right? Vis-a-vis -vis Mustar, vis-a-vis -vis all the initiatives that Mubadla has launched and, other, and Adnoc and others, right, in terms of saying, no, we're serious about weaning ourselves off of the traditional way of you know sourcing energy and how we're going to move forward and i think that's going to have a lot of impact and to your point about eyes right is that you can't you know you've got to be able to sit across from someone it's a really interesting uh, point that you bring up i remember right in the middle of you know the pandemic when the abraham accords were announced right and we had you know, talk about building trust or really that trust, you know, materializing and, and building hope. You know, we had that first group of Israelis that flew to uh, the UAE, to Abu Dhabi, to the capital. And I remember you were trying to meet people that had never been on your land before. And the only thing you could see were their eyes, right? And so, you know, the level of trust that was built in those sessions, right? Those first few sessions. And I remember this very clearly, you know, I opened the first Abu Dhabi government office in Israel. Right. We had billboards up advertising Abu Dhabi and, and what we were doing and so on. The level of trust that that requires from your own ecosystem, but from your partners to be able to deliver the, something that was completely new um, and, and frankly revolutionary for our region required a lot of trust. And that buildup of trust over time is what allowed us to be able to deliver that. Right. And so I think that we are very lucky and blessed in many ways that we have that. Uh, political cachet to be able to continue to do that uh, that here and and look to have a seat at every table where there's a decision that needs to be made to help people right. i like the point about labeling uh, things made by ai that, that, yeah. that, that paul talked about i wonder though i mean i mean 
countries and, and businesses spend years and, and so much money building up trust in their brands, you know, made made in America or whatever it might be. I wonder if we might have better luck just labeling things that are made by humans in the future, um, given probably most things will be made by AI and machine and, and automation. So I think I think that anything you do in the future, if it is it is sort of organic, people might even pay more for it. Um, we, we're moving to the Q&A uh, section of our discussion. Um, so keep your questions coming. Um, we do have a question um, that uh, initially we'll direct it to Tarek um, from the audience, which is, uh, with trust being the most critical currency, how is the UAE and its private sector encouraging neighboring countries and trade partners to elevate their trustability? So what's the influence, I guess, that the UAE is having around it? Look, I mean, a large part of it is the UAE story, right? I mean, when you go and you're working with your trade partners, when we go on these delegations, and I've been on many of these delegations, whether it be to major countries in Latin America, across Africa, Asia, and elsewhere, right? The, the, the discussion always at some point gets to how did you guys build so much over the last 25 years, right? And so I think when you can start a conversation, you know, having demonstrated the ability to execute and deliver, you already have a baseline that's far higher than most uh, you know, political and business institutions going to uh, a partner. And so it actually, what we've accomplished over the last, I'd say really in terms of the, the, the massive mega growth that we've accomplished and, and, and change in, in the economy over the past 25 years makes that conversation very easy. So when politicians see that you are able to create trust and you're able to have a more stable youth population, right? Ones that are not out protesting, ones that are not out causing havoc or, or leaving. Forget about those first two things, but they're just leaving, right? We have youth moving here, which is the opposite problem that a lot of youth face in, in other countries, right? Is I think they understand then that there are things that they can put in place that mimic what we have built that hopefully will help them if they have enough time. Time is the key consideration here, Mustafa. It's not what we've built, it's not our ambition, it's whether or not political institutions in other countries have the same time frame that we've been blessed to be able to work with vis-a-vis -vis our leadership and what can be done there. And you can see that in a few countries where we've had very strong partners. You know, I look at a country like Sri Lanka, for example, that had a failing state-owned airline that needed something to change so that they could stabilize that. And so they worked with Emirates Airlines. Emirates Airlines took over that airline for you know, the better part of almost two decades, rebranded, rebuilt, and now Sri Lankan is a fantastic airline. So when you can demonstrate that across businesses with a very stable political uh, component, you hope that the counterparty will realize that there's value to that. But again, it all comes down to the time that they're allowed to be able to push those reforms, those changes, and so on. Um, and so I hope I've answered the question in maybe an, an indirect way, but I, I think really it comes back to, you know, what is the tenure like for people that are making decisions um, versus the population that wants change uh, sooner rather than later? Yeah. Tarek, I'd like to just quickly jump on that last comment because it so pertains to where I am right now. Uh, the average tenure for a healthcare CEO in the U.S. for a healthcare leader is two years. I mean, they are just spinning over there. Uh, the leadership of healthcare, Thumbay Healthcare and the Gulf Medical University, it was the same leadership for the past 25 years. Right. And I'm I'm the new kid on the block brought in to now continue the journey forward. So I hear you loud and clear that, and this and this this models or emulates the UAE, having that consistent ethical uh, leadership since 1971, you know, that had the, the interest of the country, the interest of the citizens, the interest of the residents first. Uh, there's a lot, there are lots of countries around the world that have lots of oil, right? But they're not the UAE. It is all about the, you know the leadership and that that consistency long term of the leadership. So I hear you loud and clear. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, and I mean, and if I no, I agree, Brian. I think if I can add just one more point, I think it's also the relationship between the population and leadership, right? Or 
the political parties and so on, right? I mean, today, unfortunately, if you look at, you know, I'm half American and it troubles me what is happening in, in the US, right? My children are half British, you know? And it troubles me what's happening in the UK today when you look at, you know, the gun violence, the gun control. And unfortunately, no one actually addresses the problem. They, they want to stick to a party discussion, right? And again, not to make this a political discussion, but all of that feeds back into the population. And when people feel like it's a hopeless environment that they're in, and that they're not going to be able, that the leaders are not going to be able to effect change, and that there are no role models to look up to. I mean, the world had fantastic role models to look up to post World War II, when the likes of Churchill, Eisenhower, all these folks came up and really set an example for how they were going to rebuild, right? Those countries could have gone in very different directions, right? If you look across the spectrum today, it's very hard to find role models across business and across the political spectrum in so many places, right? And so that has a devastating long-term effect and the consequences are severe and they are measurable. People wanna pretend that they're not measurable. They're very measurable, right? And so I think that we are very blessed in this region. I would say in the wider region, when you look at ourselves, you look at the kingdom, you look at places like Bahrain and Kuwait that are trying to pivot. They're trying to look for ways that they can change, right? Oman as well. You know, we have a lot of upside uh, in terms of that trust. That's why we work very collaboratively with each other. Like all good neighbors and all family, you will have issues over time, but you resolve them, right? And so I think, uh, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I do find it an absolute privilege to be able to meet people from around the world, whether I'm here or whether I'm abroad, and be able to say, yes, I'm from the UAE. And they go, wow, what you've done is incredible, right? You will always get the occasional, yes, but you know, you don't give women rights and so on. And then it becomes an education system for, you know, for me to kind of go out and disprove the things that they're saying. Um, but you can convert people, right? And that's, that's I think, how you get things uh, moving well. Sorry, I, 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 I went over on that, but it really, it's a, it's, a, it's a point of pride for me when I look at my background from the American side and, and the Emirati side um, in terms of, you know, where we are today. Tarek, I think that's one of the, yeah, one just real quick, one of the areas that, you know, me being originally from the U.S., you know, when I'm living here now 15 years, exactly what you mentioned over and over, I hear about, oh, but what about the way that they treat women there? You know, it's, it's been a constant for 15 years. Uh, my wife, Nadine, was born here in, she born in Dubai. She runs the Dubai Business Women's Council. And, you know, in, you know, in collaboration, we're continually educating the world and she's educating the world about the reality where the representation of women in in the workplace and in, in high serious positions of government uh, far exceeds most of the rest of the world. So, you know, it's, it's, there's so much proof, so much evidence uh, that it's, it's beautiful. I really love being here. That's exactly what I was going to say, Brian, in terms of the proof, right? In terms of converting people. So there's sort of the coverage even playing out. So 10 years ago, negative coverage about the UAE. There was an amazing Telegraph piece probably about three weeks ago talking about how the UAE is the place to be and how Britain is unsafe. You're more now seeing people case studies as well. I saw on a, one of these sort of um, online news channels yesterday, a British father saying why he came to the UAE to live because of the safety, because of the leadership, because of the, um, the sort of the, the safety for his family, being able to raise a couple of kids. While in the UK, he had two cars stolen and his house broken into. People don't want that anymore, but the, the collaboration across government and institutions has led to this high trust and it's playing out in terms of safety and brand awareness. So to Mustafa's point, which he asked me at the top of this session in terms of, is this all about money? It's not, it's about brand awareness because then that will lead to trust as well. I don't know, we might be running out of time. I just want to jump in very quickly because um, as a Brit, uh, we shouldn't be too harsh on what the West and what the US and what the UK offers, right? Creativity, innovation, agency to get on, do what you want to do, amazing education, nature, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and one of the successes of the UE, I would argue, humbly argue, is, you know, the ability to be humble. It's humility, actually, to have answers to a lot of the 
um, challenges we face, but understand that it needs to build partnerships with New York University Abu Dhabi, Imperial College London, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That is a part of a humble approach to doing business and building trust. And, you know, it's easy sometimes living in the UAE to get complacent and, you know, feel like we're all doing very well and it's a wonderful place. Of course it is. But there's lots of wonderful places out there as well. And the UK is one of them, uh, I would say, as a Brit. And I would also say, look at the coronation. Now, that's, I don't want to get into that. That's a whole nother panel. But you talked about lack of trust in government. I, I'm not a monarchist, by the way, for the record. But I would say that what it does is it breaks down the political trust in red party, blue party, yellow party. And it says, actually, there's something that's, that's unifying here. And of course, we live in a in a, a very benevolent and, and have the wonderful leadership um, of his highness and, and the rest of the leadership. But actually there's something in, uh, you know, the UK about the, 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 uh, the monarchy that is, d does the same thing as well. So anyway, don't be too harsh on the, the UK, everyone. We're, we're not, we're not. I did my education in the UK. Uh, we own a home in the UK. I love the UK. Um, but what I hear you loud and clear, I think what you're advocating for is that we have a king introduced into the U.S. system to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the Republican <laughs> Democratic Party works together. <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> I've, I've applied to the job. Just, <laughs> what Paul has actually just said is that slide I presented in terms of a sh shared unifying brand. The monarchy is a, is a unifying brand for the U.K. It pulls people together. Um, and it's with a shared identity. So the UAE has that in terms of COP28, Expo, et cetera. The UK, and Paul is right to say this, there are very good things about the UK. It's financial, it's heritage, it's engineering. I went to an in Brunel University. Um, there are good things. And that's where the UAE plays a very important part in terms of being a neutral partner, bringing people together and leading by example. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I think it's time to, to thank our panel. Uh, Murtaza Virani, Paul Slinger, Brian De Francesca, and Tariq Menhendi for a very engaging and dynamic discussion today about trust. So thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been a, a very interesting morning. And I will hand over to Omar Kiram for some final thoughts uh, on, on this morning uh, before we say goodbye to you all. I think my first Thank final you. thought is that must be the easiest panel you've ever moderated, Mustafa, because the I'm conversation is just... I'm going to return the $10,000 check that you gave me because <laughs> uh, I didn't earn it. Thank you for, for, first of all, thank you for moderating um, a brilliant panel it, it, again this year. Um, but I think what we all touched on were there were common themes, as I mentioned, in terms of the country leading by example, having a shared vision, and there's co collaboration across different um, sectors, energy, healthcare, government, um, and technology, all to deliver high trust within, within the UAE. And if you look at it and go back to Edelman's point of view in terms of trust, action leads to trust, trust leads to action, i.e. giving you the license to lead, which the UAE has. And then that action leads to brand awareness. It leads to reputational um, improvements. And the UAE has done a brilliant job on that. And um, I think the panelists have been brilliant and they've all contributed very, very salient points, focused on young people, leadership, by example, um, healthcare being important still, even though the pandemic was a couple of years ago. And Paul mentioned this, that we're actually in a, we, we operate in, a, in, a, in um, a borderless world and the UAE is very humble. Um, and um, I think the leadership has created a reputation for the country, which is stellar. Um, so thank you for joining us today. It's been a very engaging conversation um, and we'll see you next year. Great. Thank you so much, Omar.